The Jake Asman Show will begin shortly. Thanks to all these great Patreon members who help support the show. Get your super chats ready. Jake will be here in just a moment. If you love the New York Jets, this is the place to be. And now, the Jake Asman Show. Should the New York Jets draft Brock Bowers? He, of course, may be the most polarizing prospect in this year's draft for every Jet fan. In today's Jake Asman Show, Joe Blewett of Jets X Factor is going to join us for an in-depth film review that will give us the truth behind the Brock Bowers discourse. It's the Jake Asman Show. Let's hit it and get it started. Man, our Jets are primed for a historic season. Jets green each and every day. This is not the same old Jets. We have Aaron freaking Rodgers. We have Garrett Wilson. Let's go. We have Brees Hall. Please subscribe and hit the like button below. Super Chat, baby. Cut the line. We have Sauce Gardner. We have Quinn and Williams. The Jets bandwagon is loaded. Now it's time to talk all things New York Jets. It's the Jake Asman Show. Ah, here we go, Jets fans. Welcome in, everybody. Happy Saturday on this fine New York Knicks and New York Islanders playoff day. Lot to talk about with our football team, the New York Jets. Before we get started, if you are an Asmaniac, we have officially added the Knoble emoji, five foot seven, 198 pounds from college. He now has his own emoji. For all the Asmaniacs out there. So if you want a channel membership, hit the join button, become an Asmaniac, or get lucky and someone gifts you an Asmaniac membership with the Knoble emoji. The pride of college is now available to use in the comment section and during the live chat. Joining me right now to talk about one of the most polarizing prospects that Jet fans have debated for very, very long. And hopefully it comes to an end less than a week from today. The great Joe Blewett of JetsXFactor.com joins us to talk Bowers and a whole lot more. What's up, Joe? Welcome to the show. I'm really excited, Jake. Um, it's been a, it's been a minute, so I'm I'm happy that I'm finally joining the show. Uh, I was really excited to get the invite, but then I saw Bowers talk. I'm like, oh, the most <laughs> possible thing on the Jake Asman show. So uh, I'm I'm excited to break it down. I, I I appreciate the invite. Yeah, you're the right guy to have on because you do such a good job on your channel, and you guys know how I feel about Jets X Factor. I mean, we we have a you know long standing relationship with Robbie Sabo and Nadia and mm-hmm. Vialco, and now you come on the show. Uh, it just is perfect because you've been doing film breakdown on so many of the top prospects throughout the off season. Mm-hmm. And I thought a couple of weeks ago when you broke down some film on Bowers, you did a great job of showing the pros and the cons on him as a prospect. So before we show mm-hmm. some of that film, and you're going to do what you do. Just your overall thoughts on on where the discourse is basically headed here with Bowers. I can't remember a debate for a non-quarterback reaching like this fever pitch that seemingly we're at right now involving Bowers. Yeah, we always kind of attach ourselves to like topics and kind of go crazy about them each offseason. Like there's always one thing. It's Darnold. Do we get rid of Darnold? It's it's Zach Wilson versus Justin Fields. You know, last year it was Rodgers versus Carr. Now it's the Bowers thing. Um we kind of talked about it before, you know, we started, it's like, there's no gray area with people, with Jets fans, with Twitter, with social media nowadays. Um, And I'm kind of, I kind of fall in the gray area. Like I can see where he has upside. Um, He's a really good athlete. You know, he has really good speed. He has really good acceleration. He's really fluid. Um, But I also have questions about, about him. You know, I didn't see him a lot versus press. I didn't see his 2022 and 2021 film, which I'll have to go back and watch. Um, But I didn't see him, you know, doing well in contested catch situations in, in 2023. So, There's a lot of gray with him. And, you know, if you're willing to take a shot on, uh, you know, a shot on him at at 10, then fine. He has really high upside, but he also has, you know, a relatively low floor as well, where he's just kind of another guy. So are you willing to take that risk at 10? Uh, We'll see in, you know, in, in five days from now. So. 
before we get to some of his film, Joe Douglas spoke yesterday and when asked about Brock Bowers, he basically said, hey, you know, the right tight end could truly be a game changer. I guess my biggest fear with taking Brock Bowers at 10 is if you look at the best tight ends in the league, none of them were top 10 picks. Most of them were not even first round picks. The best mm -hmm. tight ends in the league, we're talking about some of them being mid-round picks. Just your thoughts on just how difficult it clearly is for NFL teams to properly evaluate tight ends at the next level. Yeah, and that's one of the things, too, if you're, like, you're considering Bowers, you know, the Jets have a one-year window, maybe two. You know, obviously, if everything works out, it's two, but there's a world where it's only one year. And tight ends historically even take, you know, not even the first-round draft pick stuff. They historically take a little bit of time to develop. You know, look at Hawkinson, look at whoever else. I know some guys came in last year and were, and were pretty productive. Um but it's it's a con it's a concern because you don't really see tight ends taken so high. And the one we did in Kyle Pitts, you know, he's been good uh, with with the Falcons, but he's not maybe been hyped up to to what he he was in college. And I think Kyle Pitts, in terms of as a prospect, I know people go crazy over the numbers and Bowers did this on you know sixty five degrees on Sunday, whatever stats they're gonna find. But Kyle Pitts, to me, watching was the was the higher physical upside player. So if this was a Pitts conversation at ten, okay, I, I think I'm a little bit more favorable to it because I I see a freak of nature in Pitts. I see a good to great athlete in Bowers, but I don't see some freak of nature. It's like, oh my God, you have to draft this guy at 10. Like you can't, you can't pass on him. So it kind of depends on how the Ford, uh, how the board falls. And then also the Jets philosophy, you know, is it that offensive lineman for, for depth or do they think they can supplement the backup offensive lineman with David Bakhtiari or Cam Fleming or whoever it may be? Um, or do they, you know, get ballsy and kind of trade up for a receiver, which is where, where I'm falling right now. So yeah, you don't see a lot of tight ends come in right away and hit the ground running because you're learning two positions. You know, you're learning receiver you're learning inline blocking um so it's it's a tough transition and that's why you don't see a ton of guys drafted so highly now obviously in the last couple of years you're starting to see him move up on the boards a little bit because the game is changing a little bit but still um history says that tight ends in the in the first round or tight end side don't typically work out especially when you're talking about a year or two window with with aaron Rodgers. now i know he said three or four years realistically you know we're jets fans it's probably gonna be one or two so yeah, you're right about that. And, you know, you, you bring up Kyle Pitts. I mean, look what happened after Kyle Pitts in that draft. I mean, Jamar Chase goes two picks later. He's arguably the best receiver of the NFL. And mm -hmm. ask any Falcon fan, they'll tell you that, yeah, even though Kyle Pitts had over a thousand yards as a rookie, like he was like their only guy. It was like a lot of like just stat padding. Like he wasn't a dynamic elite weapon. I don't even think he scored a touchdown his first year uh, as a rookie in the league. So I, I just, I have my significant reservations taking Bowers at 10. I'm way more comfortable in a trade down scenario if they're able to take them and get some extra picks then i think the value makes sense to take mm -hmm. that position yeah i'm 100 I'm with you and <clears throat> it's not a thing where like hey i don't want him at 10 that means oh joe hates bowers it's like no it's not it's not this you know the case at all so if they were to trade down 15 16 17 some offensive linemen fall off the board then okay i'm perfectly i'm perfectly fine with selecting bower this is not a thing where i want him in, in, in the top 10 of the draft just considering that you know i rather one of the big re receivers and if a receiver like odunze does fall and the jets have some gumption and they want to trade up to get him then hey you know drop that third or fourth round pick to go up and get odunze who in my mind is a is a little bit better of a prospect than a Bowers. So um, I just don't, you know, and, and like you said, I'm, I'm just ready for the debate to end. And that's the problem yeah. with Bowers is even if he's drafted, the, de the, the debate's going to last for the next three or four years. He's successful. Oh, Jake hated him. Joe hated him. This guy hated him. You know, he's so great, you know, gloating. So I almost just want it not to happen. So we just completely avoid it and just draft somebody else. I just don't want to argue about this for the next four years, which is uh, going to happen. Yep. And we, we all know what's coming. It's it's crazy yeah. how that works. Kyle, let's question Super Chats for Joe Blow it. He's going to answer your questions. We'll take some calls. And we're, of course, going to show some film review mm -hmm. coming up here on Brock Bowers. KND Super Chats. He says, happy Saturday, my G, Jake, and everyone. Happy Saturday, everybody. Hit that like button. We will be having a great time talking about the Jets here on this fine Saturday morning. All right, Joe. So you're going to screen share with me and the audience mm -hmm. some film that you have on Brock Bowers. And we're going to watch you basically do your thing here, breaking down the pros, the cons, anything else that stands out on the much maligned, polarizing tight end out of Georgia. So here we go. The screen share is coming up. I'm going to put it on the screen right now, Joe. So you are mm -hmm. you are live and let's get good. you full screen. You're good to go. Okay, yeah, so these are my plays of Bowers. It's not the cleanest thing in the world just because I'm sharing the screen with you guys. Um, I'm going to go over like eight to ten plays. I'm going to do them relatively quickly, but I'm going to show some positives. I'm going to show some negatives. That's what I do in my film reviews. They're not slanted towards positivity or negativity in any way. Um, we're going to go with mostly positive first from, from Bowers. Uh, a lot of it is is the yak. So I'm going to show two good yak plays and then one where it's kind of like, hey, you know, yeah, he's a really great yak player, but are these tackles going to be – 
you know, are, are these tackle attempts going to be similar at the at the NFL level? So he's going to he's going to come in. Uh, Bowers is right here to the right side of your screen. So we'll watch it kind of discuss after this is obviously good. You have that you have a slider out. Jets do this a lot um, in terms of the athleticism in here and obviously the contact balance. It's great when you really go through it. And you, you know, in my shows, we really get into the nitty gritty of like the actual technical parts of what he's doing here in terms of avoiding contact, avoiding contact. One, uh, the, the first tackle pulling the near leg. That's something I talk about a lot in my film reviews is pulling that near leg. If you had a lot of weight on that right leg, if that defender is to take out the right leg, let's say 80% of his weight is dependent on, you know, on that leg. If that leg, is taken out he falls to the ground so good job hurdling right there pulling that near leg uh same deal with this with this tackle right here obviously guy comes from a more high and inside angle good stiff arm again pulling the near leg at that time is really emphasized you can see the importance that that player has put on pulling that near leg and, and kind of getting through the trash on the ground another guy comes high okay spin that's pretty easy another truck attempt on another another guy tries to hit him out of bounds again yak monster like nobody's doubting the, the yak monster so See that on that on that one. This is another one really, really quickly. Um, this is more of a mindset thing from Bowers that I really enjoy watching his film. Again, there are positives. I'm not, I don't hate Bowers, but there are some negatives as well. So we're again we'll stick with the positives. We have the end around here. Um Quick thing here, there's really not much not, not much to the overall play in terms of like, hey, there's so much to break down. Uh, the one thing we do notice is that obviously as he's taking the ball here, 20, whatever, whatever number this is, the DB is starting to have a good angle on him. Quick, quick stab inside makes him hesitate for just a quarter of a second, which gives him the angle. Stiff arm again. The thing I really love is the end of the play right there. Uh, Jake, you have a lot of guys, you know, and at the NFL level, I do think you need to have some type of like level of grit and like nastiness to you. And it's just as easy for him to run out of bounds here. Um, and, you know, because he's not going to pick up any extra yards by trucking this guy. But by trucking that guy, it does show you something like that's what people like to see uh, at the NFL level. And that's the thing that will kind of uh, elevate your, you know, your teammates opinion of you. So like to see that. Now, this is one where good yak, and this is something where like highlight films, like, yeah, it all looks nice, but then consider the tackle attempts. So before I even before I even break this one down, I, again, this yak, so you don't have to break a lot down with the yak. Um, the thing I want you to just think about while you're watching this is NFL tackles. Are these NFL tackle attempts? So um, I believe, okay, so he 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 fakes like he's blocking down. Okay, so yeah. fakes, like he's, fakes like he's blocking down here. First, first tackle. Okay, fine. Not the best tackle attempt. He does try to cross his helmet, but at the end of the day, he doesn't wrap. He doesn't drive his feet. Okay, so pretty bad tackle attempt. Second tackle attempt. I'm not, you know, listen, I'm not saying this guy's absolute trash. Not the best tackle attempt. Is that going to happen at the NFL level? CJ Mosley, Quincy Williams, probably not. Next tackle attempt by 31. Uh, not the best tackle attempt. You know, he picks up another three or four yards there because of that. So when you're watching this stuff, you have to say, okay, translatability, you know, is this, is, is this guy in that first tackle probably bringing him down at the NFL level considering he's somewhat good? Yes. The second one, definitely the third one, definitely. So it's things we, we have to consider with, uh, with, with Bowers, but obviously most of the yak is good. Okay. We'll move past that again, trying to, to, uh, to not make it a full four hour thing. Like I usually do, um, Bowers down blocks. This is a play I actually do like in terms of, in terms of his blocking, he does offer, um, blocking upside for sure. Right off the jump, uh, I'm assuming this is just a wrinkle with Georgia's offense and how they do this. But that 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 fake step inside, fake zone step, we want to call it a, a you know a punch step, whatever we're calling it, doesn't really matter. It's obviously just a little wrinkle to to get that defensive end there just to hesitate for a second. So Bowers is able to get outside leverage on him for a play that is going outside leverage. The one thing I do like about Bowers here is a lot of guys, a lot of young guys are just bad players in general will tend to take this block and go heads up here. And when you go heads up, it's obviously going to be easier for this defender to cross your face and get involved in the play. So the thing I really, really like about this play is he works outside and vertical before he makes contact um, with the defensive end. That's very important because again, if he makes contact head up, you know, him versus the defensive end, it's going to be really hard for him to maintain his positional leverage in front of him, meaning outside um, without his kind of hips outside of him um, and his body under his block. So we like that. We like that he wins first contact right there. Good hand placement with the, with the right hand. Now past that, um, what else do we like? We like the fact that he's working off his insteps. Talk about that a lot in the stream as well, or, or in my show as, uh, as well, insteps. Uh, kind of just the, the, the midpoint of your foot. And when you drive through your insteps, it kind of just basically it works against the natural pivot point of your knee. Um, it, it's it's a lot easier to bend to bend somebody's leg at at the at the knee like at the pivot point, and you kind of turn your leg sideways. It's kind of hard to to drive them backwards because their knee's not necessarily going to bend. So we like the we like the the angle. We like the punch step, the the, the false step, uh, whatever we're going to call it. We like we like the first contact. We like the fact that he's working off his insteps on that block, and he obviously does a good job of holding that defensive end um, to the to the inside net. 
there. Okay. Positives. Now, negatives blocking wise, um, not, not an inline guy. There's some technical things that I, I'm going to talk about on this, on, on this play that I do want him to clean up, but he's right here um, attached to the line of scrimmage. Let's watch this block. So this is something where you're going to say, oh, well, you know, he could block defensive ends at the, at the, at the, at the you know, at the NFL level. Not something I feel like he could do, um, at least as of now. He's, what, 6'3", 240 or, or something like that. So he's yep. not the biggest guy um, in the world. And with that being said, like the technique's not necessarily terrible here. There's a few, there's a few things I want to see him clean up in terms of this play. Um, one, we don't necessarily want our head ducking. We don't want our hands kind of coming over over the top as they are. Uh, typically here, you're going to see a, you know, a, 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 uh, you know, a blocker get his right hand over the top, call it like a half moon punch or just a containment punch, get it over the top, and, and really going to be driving his shoulder to the outside and that's going to obviously uh, prohibit him from getting to the inside and then typically this left hand is going to be a little bit more lift instead of push it's going to come underneath through this thumb kind of turned out and you're going to, uh, going to attempt to control the middle of the chest and then what we really want is him to swivel his hips around here to maintain again positional leverage to the inside um and again positional leverage just means like place you know the play side gaps the play side gap is is, is the b gap here not the c gap so uh we want him to defend that 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 uh that b gaps so we want him to swivel his hips around um and and stay in front of that block. So not the best technique. And then what we're seeing here too is in, the, in terms of him kind of taking that, like we call it like a drop step right there or, or like a brace step. He's trying to brace with that instep right there to, to hold up against this, this defender. Um, and that's probably because he's not big enough to really be confident enough for him to swivel his hips around and still get, um, you know, that like positional leverage while not getting driven back. So he's right here, not trying to get driven back, but at the same point, he's going to be too flat for this guy to not cross his face. So, um, some bad there again. I don't think he's, you know, if he can't do it versus Tennessee, is he able to do it versus Max Crosby at the next level? Probably not. Again, more of like a move blocker, a guy who was going to block, you know, safeties, corners, linebackers, crack blocks, assisting, um, defensive linemen. But in terms of like being straight up zone with a guy, um, it's just, that's just not going to necessarily work out. Now we're going to some good route running from him. I have a bad one. If okay. you had to give a grade though on his blocking and all the film you watch, like would you say it's a mm. would you say it's a weakness? Would you say he's average at it? It's is it a strength? Like how would you like mm -hmm. just specifically talk about his blocking? Because I've heard some Jet fans say, "Well, yeah. everyone wants offensive line, but Bowers is a really good blocker too, so that helps you there as well." Like in your evaluation, like your thoughts is overall on his blocking. Yeah, it, it kind of depends on like the question you're exactly asking. If you're asking him to be Gronkowski and block in line, then you're then you know then the Jets are an idiot or or, or idiots. Which the problem is like, hey, Hackett, you know, proven that you know he didn't know Brees Hall was fast or couldn't catch passes until week eight of you know last year nine whatever it was. A little bit concerning, but if if you're asking him to block in space again, linebackers, safeties, crack blocks, um, second level, third level blocks, and I think he's good. Um, I think he's good on the first level in terms of like assisting tackles. Um, you know, if, if he kind of has a jump on a guy, he's good in that aspect. But in terms of like, again, one on one blocking with the defensive end, either in pass or in the run game, I, I think you're, 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 you're really mistaken there. So it's, it's good, but it depends on, again, on the situation. Good, you know, not in the box. Or, or yeah, good, not in the box, great, not in the box, um, but bad in the box, just because, just because of his lack of size, you know, he's more of like a hybrid receiver than he is really like a true, like a true tight end at this point. So, um, I don't know if you have a, a follow-up question or if you want me to keep going. I can't yeah, see keep, you, so I can't really say. Yeah, uh, so keep going. Now you're doing a great job. I hope people are enjoying this. Hit the like button. We'll do some mm -hmm. questions for for Joe coming up here. But I wanted to give people, as we're less than a week away from the draft, a real inside look. Yeah into a Brock Bowers because obviously there's a lot of narratives out there about a player and, and Joe has watched a lot of film on all these guys, including Bowers. So it was good to get him on to show this. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I was kind of talking to you about this before, Jake. It's like I, I got a, I got a, I got a wife, I got a new kid, I got a full time job, and there's people on Twitter like you didn't watch all three of his seasons and the, all all the other prospects <laughs> on all the Jets guys. Like, yeah, just relax. Like, I'll I'll, I'll get to seasons uh, 21 and 22 if he's drafted by the Jets. But uh, he's in the slot right here, um, verse 21. Um, he's on he's on a corner route, really good in terms of setting up his 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 route here in terms of his in terms of his footwork. Um, I didn't cut this one the best, but um, he uses a rocker step, so he closes ground um, in his stem and his drive phase. You know, shoulders down, showing the the you know just getting on the defensive back's toes. Um, as he gets into like that contact window, which I typically refer to as like that two to three yard range. You know, when you're expecting contact from a defender, um, he breaks down. 
rocker step, you're going to see that right foot come outside this frame just a little bit. And when that right foot comes outside that frame a little bit in conjunction with that head nod to the inside, the DB is thinking, okay, it's an inside break. And you can see how the DB's feet are pretty patient and he shuffles to the inside big when he does that, uh, jumps to the jumps to the inside. Uh, Bowers obviously then uh, uses like a club and an arm over uh, just in case that the hand was there and then is wide open for the corner out. And that's one of the things I do do when I'm watching players. I'm not just watching targets or anything like that because if I watch targets, I wouldn't see this play. Uh, it's a really good route from from him uh, with the with the with the rocker step. Um, again, just that that right foot, you know, extending outside the frame, fake uh, break to the inside. Okay, get to the outside. He's wide open on the corner out. Okay, you know, good play. We'll watch. Uh, another another good one from him uh, in terms of the route running. I can go over like the specifics of his route running in terms of like where he struggles, where he needs some some work. But we'll continue on. Um, this is in terms of him getting vertical. I don't think he's the best guy in terms of getting vertical. Uh, in terms of like contested catches, tracking the ball, which we'll go over in in the negative portion of this. We only have you know kind of like one more really positive play, which is this one. Uh, he's in the slot right here, man. Uh, man covered. I don't know if this is a. I don't know if this is like a, you know a slot corner. I don't know if it's a linebacker, safety, whatever it may be. It doesn't really matter. Uh, he's going to use a short stride release, so he's just going to get onto the DB's toes with shorter strides. When you when you have shorter strides, you really just have better control of your of your lower half. You're threatening both ways obviously the longer the stride the longer the step the less you're connected to the ground you can't react as quickly um and sometimes when you short stride guys you're kind of giving them the illusion that you're running full speed um and you're maybe not as in, as in control as, as as you are but when you short stride again you're 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 very in control of your body so he's in the slot right here he's gonna get vertical on this on this linebacker db exactly whatever he is and that's an aspect where okay hey the jets in a situation like this, let's say the safety doesn't get over there, can Rodgers lead him to the outside? You know, hopefully. We'll talk about the ball tracking a little bit, but good route from, from Bowers, again, getting on the toes. We can see shorter strides, gets into that contact window, um, doesn't want to, again, you don't want to get, you don't want to eat up too much ground. That like that two yard range is, is a pretty good time to break because if you get right on his toes, then guess what? He's going to punch you. He's going to contain you. Um, so he gets that, you know, he gets that contact window again, breaks to the outside. We're seeing him reach over, chop down on that defensive back's arm uh, or linebacker, or whatever he is, gets vertical. Okay. So good vertical route. Now we have another route. Um, this was, this is kind of more, um, and I know, I think he was injured uh, prior to this game. This was the first game he came back from an ankle injury. So some people were saying like, oh, that's why the vertical is not so high. But this is a play I watched. I'm like, hey, if he's like an elite tight end in terms of his athletic ability, this is probably a catch that he makes. Uh, he's right here. I, yeah, I, he's right here attached to, or not, not necessarily attached, but he's more like an H back here. But nonetheless, he's right here um, and we'll we'll roll it. Gets vertical. Um, the thing I like, it's it's you know you can call it a stem corner, a post corner. It's not like a real true post. I'm not going to get into the specifics of like talking about you know you know uh, you know circus routes and 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 stem corners and and post corners and all that stuff. They're all a little bit different, but we'll call it a post corner right now for simplicity reasons. Um, good job. Again, breaking to the inside. Uh, when he when he when he starts to break to the inside, he uses a peak technique. Peak technique really sounds exactly what it is. He peaks for the ball. He peaks to the inside, getting the DB to bite into the inside. Again, does a good job of not taking it too vertical. He doesn't want to get too far into that contact window. Break to the outside, club arm over, uh, wins on the on the corner route. Now the problem comes with you know when you're watching him in this vertical right here. Not necessarily the the most athletic jump there. Now okay. He was injured, but it's something to add to the to the to the puzzle, right? Like, does a Kyle Pitts catch this ball in terms of like being a, a absolute freak freak of nature? And it's something that maybe comes with watching a little bit. You can kind of notice that, like, you know, I know people will freeze frame stuff and be like, oh, like the vertical looks great, and like they'll they'll, they'll pause it like here and be like, look at that vertical. Realistically, he got like two inches off the ground right there, um, and the ball goes over his head. Okay, so good route. The athleticism there a little bit a little bit lacking in terms of the vertical and i know people are gonna say oh well he you know he had a 40 inch vertical completely different when you're playing the game but keep in mind that he was um he was injured prior to that game i, I believe so i have two plays left of, of bowers we're gonna show some some negatives as well and you saw some negatives in the positives there um no contested so he is right here. And this is one of my biggest problems with his film in 2023 was I think I saw him catch like maybe one or two out of 10 contested catch situations. And one of them was one handed, which transparently is it's, it's more luck. Like you can't go to the NFL level relying on, on, you know, one handed catches. It's just not necessarily going to work. It's not replicatable. So right here to the bottom of the screen. Let's see him um, not bringing this contested catch. And again, it was one of my biggest issues with his game. And then some people will say, oh, well, the numbers were better. 
in uh, the numbers were better in 21 and 22, which, okay, completely understandable. But then there's the, the process of it. Like, I don't even like the process of how he goes about um, attacking this ball and, and kind of boxing himself out. Um, you have good tight ends here who will hold the ground a little bit longer. So you want to see him really pressing into this guy. Now, you don't want to get full extension because refs are looking for full extension. You're 100% locked out, 95, 90, maybe even 85 are going to get called. But a lot of guys will kind of just keep their um, their arms a little bit shorter and kind of just like chuck them a little bit at the end. So I want to see him hold his ground a little bit better here. You want to see him push off a little bit better than he does. He attacks the ball pretty early there, which gives the DB time to obviously attack the ball as well. It's hard to tell in this angle if the DB actually gets his hand in there, but we could see Bowers, um, you know, not really even get semi close to catching the ball. It kind of squirts through his hands right there. And then again, the process of going about this is not even that good. Uh, again, you know, physical tight end, you're expecting him to hold his line a little bit better here, not drift to the outside, push off a little bit later than he does. And his push off isn't really there. So the process isn't even good about catching that ball. And then he drops it. Um, and there's quite a few of that. There's, there's a, quite a few of those plays on his film um, from 2023. And I was going into it expecting, again, I, I go into it. I don't really read scouting reports. I don't really get into that stuff because I want to have a fresh mind to what the player is. But you, you, you hear it trickle out a little bit, right? And you hear how great this guy is generational. I was expecting like Gronkowski. And then every single contested catch situation I was watching, he just wasn't coming down with it. Again, transparently, I know there's 21-22. Last play um, of Bowers. This is the bad tracking that I brought up. Uh, he's right here. He like chips in releases here, gets vertical. And then you're going to see him uh, gear down for the ball. And I'll talk about, you know, kind of why that's important. So chips and releases, a little bit of confusion there, I think from the linebacker DB on, uh, on, you know, who he has in coverage or, or the assignments right there, because you know, the one becomes the, or the two becomes a three, the three becomes a two, all of that stuff. Um, the problem with this play here is, and again, I know the people on Twitter will freeze frame it and say, how is he supposed to catch that ball? The ball is so high, you know, it's impossible. But again, the process. So when quarterbacks are throwing balls, like especially it doesn't matter, even matter like vertically, digs, whatever it may be, um, they're anticipating like how fast you're you're going to be running. So okay, the quarterback knows Brock Bowers runs 20 miles per hour. Okay, I'm anticipating him running 19.5, you know, 19 miles per hour. Because if you're running 100, percent you know, of your speed, typically when you turn your head around just biomechanically, it's going to slow you down. Some guys it slows them down one percent. Some it, it slows them down five. Um, what we don't want to see is Bowers release here. And then what I want people to, to, to now notice after I played it the first time is watch how much he gears down here. And it's, it's almost impossible for the quarterback to kind of uh, figure out where he's going to be. So, okay, releases, gets vertical. And watch how slow he runs right here, tracking that ball. And then he has to jump. If he were to run, you know, faster and, and find that ball better. He doesn't gear down as much as he does right there. Um, he catches that ball. So it's a thing where again, freeze frame scouting, people say, Oh, it's impossible for him to catch that ball. But then you watch it through again. I'll play it one more time. And then we'll exit out of here. You cannot, you can't slow down to 50% when tracking a ball, then say it's an overthrow. You know, you got to keep like 90% of your speed at the minimum. And you can see how slow he goes once he looks back for it. So is it an overthrow or is it bad tracking? Uh, to me, it's, it's, it's bad tracking all day. in that scenario, um, so there it is. There's there's some good. There's some bad of Bowers. Um, it's not a thing where I'm saying that I, I hate him, but I have plenty of questions about him, right? Like I didn't see him a lot versus press. I have questions about his blocking. I have questions about um, you know, his ability contested catch wise. I've I have his question I have questions about his fit in the offense and how Hackett will really utilize him. So a lot of gray area with Bowers. You know, great breakdown there, Joe. Thank you so much for for sharing all that. So, you know, with that all being said, when you evaluate him versus, let's say, the other weapons, like where 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 do you have the top receivers versus Brock Bowers? Like where where would Brock Bowers rank as the best option among the the weapons if you're kind of power ranking the top guys that just could potentially be in on? Yeah, yeah, I would say I would say it's the three receivers over him, um, and then it, it's he's he's at four. So I'm in the camp of I'm definitely willing to trade up for Marvin Harrison Jr. I wouldn't say like in typical years I, I would be willing to do that just because like listen if the Jets are seven and are, are seven and ten like you know why do we need to to make that all in move? But in terms of like getting over the hump in the AFC when you have to go up against you know hopefully well, hopefully the Jets are doing this but going up against Kelsey Reed and Mahomes like that that 
that weapon may make the difference where, and I know we'll probably get into the offensive line stuff. Um, that offensive lineman, let's say you draft like a pure tackle. Let's say, let's just say it's, it's Fashano to make it easy. That player is sitting on the bench in the Super Bowl, you know, considering that Tyron Smith has played every playoff game, um, considering that Morgan Moses has been relatively healthy. So like the ceiling of your team, I think greatens with a receiver where I think the floor of your team raises with a tackle, but it's kind of about, about your personal philosophy. And if you think that, you know, you need that extra piece to push you over the top to beat Patrick Mahomes, which I think, you know, you need. So, uh, but I would say, I would say, yeah, it's Harrison Jr. One, um, neighbors two, Odunze three, relatively large gap. And then you have Bowers and another relatively large gap and whether, you know, whatever your cup of tea between, um, you know, guys like uh, Worthy or uh, Brian Thomas Jr. Great breakdown right there. All right. Joseph Fenster has just become an as maniac, baby. Boom. <laughs> Welcome aboard, Joseph. Comments, questions for Joe Blowett of JetsXFactor.com. Joe, great breakdown there on Brock <laughs> Bowers, giving you an idea on the pros and the cons of arguably the most polarizing prospect amongst Jet fans during draft season here. Jay Quest has got a question for you, Joe. He wants to know, what are your thoughts on Tyler Conklin? I feel like he could do the job. That's the other part of the Bowers discourse that I think personally drives me crazy. I'm not sitting here telling you that Tyler mm -hmm. Conklin is Travis Kelsey, but he is top 10 the last two years in yards and receptions with terrible quarterback play. And I think he's a good enough player, him and Ruckard, where if the Jets addressed a different position in the first round, that might make more sense because I truly think with Rodgers back, Conklin could be a real player for this team. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you're talking about like what his first year is like sixth in tight, end, tight ends and receiving yards. This year is like eighth or ninth or something like that. I, I think Conklin's a good player. And and it upset me because I really pumped him up coming from the Vikings. And like, you know how Jets fans are like his first couple of games is like drop, drop, fumble, fumble. And like, oh, blue, it's an idiot. But no, he's a, he's a good player. He's a good route runner. He's an OK blocker. He's not he's not like su supreme in any one of those like the blocking areas. But he's a really good route runner. Like if you're talking about six, you know, six in, in, in receiving yards with like you know, guys like Zach Wilson and, you know, Trevor Simeon and all these scrubs we've had with Rodgers, like he could be easily a six, 700 yard guy. Now I do want to say like, okay, other side of the argument is, oh, well, he's not a tight end. So he's not necessarily going to take away from Conklin. If he was drafted, you know, let's say Conklin, I don't know exactly what he played last year, something maybe like 75, 80% of the reps, whatever exactly it is. Maybe it lowers five, 10, 15% with Bowers because there are going to be some 11 personnel looks where you're going to want maybe, you know, Bowers over Conklin. And then you have whoever receiver three is and that's, scenario um so bowers i think takes more away from lazard and receiver three than i do than i than i think conklin but i think jets fans are too low on conklin i i think conklin is is, is definitely a, a pretty damn good receiving tight end now i don't think he's one of the best because he's not the best blocker he's kind of just average there but in terms of receiving tight ends he's he's easily a top 10 guy so i think rogers can definitely take advantage of him what are your thoughts when you watch Jeremy Rucker the last couple of years? Do you see the potential there? Because the other thing with Bowers, yeah. too, if you take him, I mean, look, I'm not saying you can't take him because you, you used a third-round pick a couple of years ago on mm -hmm. Rucker, but you're basically acknowledging that he's not he's a non-player for you. Like, he's going into year three, he finally gets an opportunity to play, and you take Brock Bowers at number 10, well, then all of a sudden there was really no role for Jeremy Rucker going forward. So just your thoughts on Rucker and how he factors in to what the Jets could potentially do if they don't take Bowers, they go mm -hmm. with someone what else and Rucker gets a chance to play a little bit yeah I liked him I like him coming out of Ohio State um his first year he barely saw the the field and then last year was like very volatile for him where he would make like one really great block in the open field and then completely whiff on like a split block or whatever whatever it was so I would say volatility volatility but I think he has upside like he's he's pretty athletic um he's physical you know he seems like he seems like a no-nonsense guy who like wants to get after it you know he's fighting Michael Clemens and in, in the offseason stuff like that so he has some of like that that New York grit and obviously we all love him because of because of his dad and and you know obviously his his being a Jets fan and that stuff so I think he has upside but it's not a thing where I see record right now and you minus the fact that he's a Long Island guy and all this stuff New Yorker and his dad's awesome it seems like every other Jets fan uh, you take away that stuff you know he's kind of just been another guy you know at the end at the NFL level but I like him more than what he showed at the NFL level right now so I think there's some un untapped potential with Jeremy Ruckert I think he could be a solid tight end too I don't think he's proven that I don't think he's proven that yet so if they were to bring in another guy and he's tight end three it kind of is what it is um, but I do think there's upside there Folks, I'm not going to lie to you all. I was out late last night, and when I got back from my uh, night out, you know what I did? I immediately started pounding some water that had Liquid IV in it. Today's show, sponsored by Liquid IV. Stay hydrated. Promo code Jake Asman. 20% discount with your purchase. It's easy. You take one of these pouches. You put it in your cup of water, and boom, one cup of water becomes three cups of water. That's the type of hydration you're getting. 
courtesy of Liquid IV. So if you want to help with your hangover, stay hydrated. Promo code Jake Asman, 20% off with your purchase over at Liquid IV. Comments, questions, super chats for Joe Blowett. Joe, are you ready for some calls here? I mean, the Bauer boys could be out there. Are you ready to deal with them? It's completely fine. I, I listen, like I know a lot of people. It's just it, it's crazy to me. I've said this on Twitter. It's crazy that people were like were like willing to be f- like fist fight, getting fist fights over five minutes of research. So if that <laughs> if it's one of those guys, then it is what it is. I'm used to it. There we go, baby. Power boy. NY Jets, Florida. First up, uh, what's up? Why? What's up, gentlemen? Power hey, uh, I well, maybe a half Bauer boy. I, I I love Bowers, but um, I have okay. a question for Joe. Joe. Do you think JD is conventional team building or are we the Rams or the Buccaneers where, you know, we're in a two year window? We, we, were, we obviously are in a two year window, but is he thinking about two, three, four years down the road when we're, the cupboard is bare? You know, that's what I'm trying to figure out. What's going to be JD's mm-hmm. philosophy? Is, I mean, do we go and, you know, trade down a few spots? Uh, you know, take alignment and maybe come back for our lad McConkey. Uh, we have to consider ABT's health because obviously mm-hmm. he's, he hasn't been healthy. Um, so just wanted your opinion on that first. Yeah, I think that kind of comes into the, like the talk of the offensive line versus the the receiver type of deal, right? In terms of like building out that depth, but kind of based on what we've done in this offseason, you, you think he's more leaning towards going all in, right? Like Tyron Smith, kind of an all in move. Mike Williams, more of an all in move. So um, I think the, the smart thing, and I get people wanting to say like offensive line to build out that depth and you have the, the offensive line going forward. But again, it's about the ceiling of what this year could be with the Jets. And you may only have one shot. Like if it doesn't work out, then everybody may be fired and then we kind of lose that opportunity and then we're sitting there for 20 years again hoping to just have another shot so you know based on the moves of, of the offseason again getting a lot of these like higher upside veterans who are a little bit risky you know we haven't necessarily seen him go all in yet but i think all indicators are pointing towards the fact that he will now it last last year disheartened you a little bit right because like we had that opportunity and say like, hey you know, our tackles were injured last year. Let's just throw quarter Warren to the mix and hope that fixes everything. So that was really disheartening. But this year, he seemed to change his tune um, a little bit. And I, th- I think he is more trending towards being aggressive um, and potentially even jumping up in the draft to grab one of the receivers. Okay, so you think a trade-up. Do you, what, what percentage would you give a trade-up as opposed to a trade-down if you had to kind of consider the situation, in your opinion? <laughs> Yeah, it will. If you're if you're if you're saying like it's either it's either of the two and it's not like just like just, you know, st- standing put at, at 10, I think trading up is probably the better opportunity because the Jets kind of hold the cards there in terms of like, hey, if they want to go be aggressive, go up and get that go up and get that guy. Now, kind of depends. Like, are you fighting another team for for quarterback? Because then obviously the, the value is raised and maybe the Jets aren't willing to give up what another team would because they're going to get a quarterback where receiver is not necessarily as as impactful. But I would say trade up just because the trade down like. Who's trading? Who's trading da- up to the Jets for what? Like people just assume right. because of PFN mock draft simulator that they could just trade down all the time, <laughs> but realistically they probably won't be able to. So I would I would say trade up if I if I had to guess. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, I I've, I've been saying it for months. It's it's a lot easier to trade down in you know fantasy land than it actually is when you're doing the draft. Like you got to mm-hmm. consider what teams are trading up. But if the run on quarterbacks happens one two three and four or one two three and then maybe like pick five or six with the Giants, like. Our team's really trading up for the fifth quarterback at that point. I'm not sure. So I, I'm right there with you, Joe. Sam yeah, well, Aiken. Okay, sorry. No, no, yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it's funny that people like they'll kind of say the one side of it. They'll be like, hey, well, we, we can trade down because of all of these great tackles. And, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a group of three or four of them we like. Why not trade down to 15 and just pick the one that's available? The teams at 15 can be saying the same thing. Like, why are we trading up when we like this group of three guys? You know, so it's just it's, it's funny. 100%. Uh, super chat from Sam writes in, true or false, at least – Eight wide receivers in this draft will have a better season than Bowers. Why do we need him? Now, I would probably say false, but I'm not an expert (laughs) like you, Joe. Your thoughts on this one? Yeah, um... I would I would say there's that's a little bit too much hating on the Bowers and it's like how do you quantify a good season because a, a, a great season for a tight end might be you know 700 yards and a, and a couple of touchdowns where a receiver like we're expecting 1k if we're trading up for for a guy or if we land a guy in, in in the in the first round so it's all about how you quantify it. if you're just going based on stats yeah maybe there's eight receivers who have more yards than he does but actual better players than 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 Bowers I don't I don't think so super chat from Joseph Fenster who just became an Asmaniac earlier thank you Joseph 
Two part question. If a quarterback falls to 10, Sean Payton wants him, move the 12, and they're willing to trade Cortland Sutton. What does that trade look like? And do you go offensive tackle or playmaker? So Denver does not have a second round pick. So in this hypothetical scenario, they're trying to move up two spots. They dangle Cortland Sutton. Would that intrigue you, Joe Blowett? Yeah, now it's dependent on like how much does he want to get paid, right? Because the reason he's sitting out of OTAs right now is because he wants to get paid. And I think the Jets are somewhere around like negative $2 million considering the draft class. So can you make another $15 million or whatever exactly he's going to demand? And I know there's there's ways to move the contract around, but then you consider like, hey, you know, Sauce, JJ, Garrett Wilson, Brees, Reed, and Michael Carter II. It's like there's a lot of money to be doled out. But again, I'm more of the all-in mindset. So if it's a situation where, hey, you know, the Jets couldn't land that that trade up and they want to trade down, uh, you know, two spots for, you know, a receiver who I think is a legit number two in this league, then I, I would be willing to do it. But it's about the price. And if the Jets can actually make it work, you know, I'm not back there in their uh, financial rooms, like kind of deciding if we can make it work. If they can, great. If they can't, you know, then then, then it is what it is. But um, I was going to say, I'll tell you what, like it, it, if they, even if they can't get Sutton, but Denver wants to move up two spots and they'll flip you their third. Like I would do that and just get, and still get this probably the same player I'm targeting mm -hmm. at 10, get them at 12. Yeah, for sure. Uh, just for two spots, like a third round pick, I, I'd be more than willing to do it. Now it's, it's about who's on the board, right? Like if it's, if it's all the receivers are gone, then okay, I'm willing to trade down because, you know, do I have the biggest gap between like Fashanu, Fatanu, whoever? Um, no, but if a is there, I'm not trading, I'm not trading down. 100%. Now, give me uh, give me your big board on the, the offensive tackles real quick here. I know you've done a lot of film on all these guys. I, yeah. You're not as high on Joe Alda as seemingly a lot of mm -hmm. people are, so I wanted to ask you about that. I'd be remiss if we didn't bring that up before we, we get some more calls and super chats here. Yeah, for, first time, and I'm I'm uh, I'm dunking on Bowers a little bit, talking about Bowers, and then and then uh, <laughs> dis discrediting Joe Alt. So I'm sure people will react well to that. Um, yeah, it's like I, I like Alt. I th I think Alt's a good player. I think Alt has a relatively low ceiling. I don't think he's the best athlete in the world. And at a certain point, like it it sounds great to be what six eight six nine. Like that's that's awesome. But it's not so much about height at the NFL level. It's really about length. Height actually hurts you if anything. Like I rather have a guy who's, you know, six four with 35 inch arms and a guy who's, you know, six, nine with 35 inch arms, just because, you know, a lot of the game is about leverage and getting your hips underneath of guys. And Alt struggles with that um, in, in my mind. And, you know, he's a good player, but you look at some of his, his past pro reps, like he, he plays, like he has good punch timing. He has good extension, all that stuff, but he, he tends to really keep guys at length, which is not good at the NFL level. You want to get guys really close to you and kind of control them. Um, so there are some flaws in his game where I don't think he's the perfect prospect. I'm not saying he's a bad prospect, anything like that, but, uh, he is my tackle too in this class. I think there's a few other people who have said that, and I know he's been like the hype of the off season to go against the grain and people are like, Oh my God, Joe Alt, you know, again, there's people watching him, maybe four snaps, you know, whatever it may be, but just because people said it, like, you know, now he's the top guy. Um, I think, I think he's good. I just don't think he's some elite prospect that I would trade up for. Like people talk about trading up for Joe Walt early in the off season. I watch him like absolutely no way. So uh, in terms of the big board for the tackles, I do have Latham at, at one for the jets. I know people will hate that. It is what it is. Um, I think that kind of goes, it, it kind of really shows you like how shallow some evaluations are. People watched the Michigan game. He got blown up on the last play. Oh my God. He's so bad. Now his entire season sucks. You actually go back and watch that Michigan game. I put up a, a film review of it. He actually had a really good game, minus one play. Um, so Latham's my one, Alt's my two, uh, Fashano is my three, is my three, uh, Fatano is my four, and Fuaga is my five. I haven't done a lot of work on like Mims or the other or, or the other guys yet. So so your your thoughts on Fatanu as a potential option because of the AVT comp, he could play all the different positions. I want your I want your breakdown on him. Yeah, so I watched him. I watched him in passing while I was watching Odunze. Um, I like I like the prospect. I like his athletic upside. Uh, to me, he's definitely different than I, I think people kind of relate him to ABT because of the inside out versatility. But in terms of like one for one as a player, uh, ABT and him are different in my, in my opinion, just because you know uh, Fatanu is a little bit more like explosive and he and he a little, you know, a little bit more volatile in his play. One splash play, one bad play. Where ABT was a was a good athlete. I'm not going to say he's as good as an a, of an athlete as Fatanu was, but. ABT was much more controlled and technically sound than a guy in Fatano, but I wouldn't be mad with the with the Fatano pick just because he can play inside outside. Now you kind of have to ask yourself a question of like, hey, you know, a rookie coming into the NFL, do you want him cross training at left tackle, right tackle, left guard, right guard? Like, is that the best way to necessarily develop a guy? Probably not, but do you do it if he's drafted? 
um, probably, but it offers you great versatility in the offensive line. Um, it's not a pick I would be thrilled with at, at 10. It would be more like trade down. Okay, I'm okay with Fatano. Um, but yeah, he's a little he was a little volatile. I'm not sure if he's going to succeed at, at, at tackle or guard at the NFL level, but um, he's definitely an interesting prospect. To set up this next question, because we're all dying to get the Joe Blewett breakdown on a prospect who is seemingly skyrocketing up the draft boards, we first have a clip to show. All right, let's go back to Bob in Vermont. I wanted to ask you, what do you think the Jets and Giants will do on the draft, your choices? And also, do you ever hear of a player from college called Kenobu? Kenobu? From what school? College. Yeah, but what college? It's just college. Do you ever hear that guy's name? No, I've never heard of, of Kenobu from college. Kenobu. Kenobu from college? What position yeah. does he play? Uh, he plays offense and defense. He plays offense and defense? He's a two-way guy? Yep, that's what they, he said. How do you spell the last name? Uh, Kenobo. I can't remember how you spell it. It starts with K, I know that. Okay, because I'm spelling it wrong on Google. Kano. No, Kenobo. Thanks for the call, Bob. I do not know who Kenobo is. Maybe somebody listening knows of a player, a two-way player coming out of college that gives you like 300 options I don't, I'm looking at zoo he's just laughing i'm, I'm trying to find out a two-way player plays offense and defense <laughs> kenobo is coming joe you've done the film breakdown on kenobo should the jets consider kenobo at number 10 or is he skyrocketing to a point where they're gonna have to trade up for him I think a player who could play both sides of the ball with that high of an RAS, you're, you could you could take you could take the, the the risk on him again. A little bit a little bit raw in, in some of his you know some of his techniques around the NFL field, but uh, overall, I would say just based on the athleticism, uh, you 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 take that bet on a guy like him, especially which I heard was just hilarious that he even like thought this was a thing. But the forty seven inch vertical thing got me because that is just absurd but uh when you, when you have a guy with a 47 inch vertical one of the higher ones you'll ever see whether it be you know co uh you know football or basketball i i think you should take him i'm right there with you i mean matt o'leary was nice enough to you know look into the you know the testing numbers that came out the only knock on the guy is he's 5'7 198 but he makes up for it with his heart you know you look at the agility grade the speed grade the explosion grade and you know, that to me is top 10 worthy i mean not many guys can play both sides of the ball joe yeah, no, and I, I think he's a slot corner, slot receiver. That's what he's probably going to play at the NFL level. But if you needed him to play safety, you know, tight end, obviously pretty stocky here. So I think he can hold up a little bit in line. So, uh, yeah, exciting player. No doubt about it. All right, comments, questions, super chats for the great Joe Blewett. Everything is on the table. This one is from Aaron, who's got his free as maniac super chat. Wanted to get this out for a while. Never catch you live. What about an elite wide receiver making $30 million versus elite mm -hmm. tight end making $15 million? just like my portfolio diversified. I mean, that's part of the Bowers discourse too. It's like, if you take him in the top 10, he's already one of the higher paid tight ends in football just mm -hmm. by the nature of his draft stock. So that that's part of the evaluation as well. It's why I'm way more comfortable in the trade down taking him because he wouldn't be paid as much as some of the top guys. If you get him lower in the first round. Yeah, in terms of the value, you're right too. Like he's, it, it's like a top ten tight end contract. So you're expecting him to be a top ten guy. Like if, if you know, and obviously you just want the better player. But like if Odunze is just an average player, but you're paying him five million dollars a year, six million dollars a year, whatever exactly it is, you know, you're paying average receivers today in today's NFL fourteen, fifteen, sixteen million dollars. So for bang for your buck. Um, it's definitely more like financial, financially beneficial to go and, and, and get the, get the receiver just because they make so much more money. And that's typically why you see guys drafted high because of the contracts, you know, left tackles make a lot of money. Quarterbacks make a lot of money, obviously receivers now corners, you know, edge rushers. So you usually see the premium positions because of the value of the contract as well. So something to consider for sure. Let's keep rolling with some calls. Matias is on the line. He's got the Islander Jersey on. Let's go, baby. Let's go, boys. It's playoff time in New York, Jake. We got the Islanders, we got the Knicks, and we got the Rangers. But, Joe, I, I don't know, you know what your preferences are in terms of hockey or um, uh, or basketball. But I'm a Devils fan and a Nets fan, so I'm sad over here. <laughs> okay, all right, all good, all yeah. good. But I just wanted to say I agree with, with your points, uh, Joe, in terms of powers. Oh, uh, did we lose you, Matias? You get a call, you get a text, put your phone on, do not disturb. There we go. I'm good, I'm good. 
<laughs> yeah, but um, I agree with Joe's point in terms of Bauer is that do we really trust this organization? Do I really trust um, our, our offensive really develop Bowers and for it, especially in a win now situation for him to be that guy to be a good volatile weapon I mean let's be real like everybody's claiming that this guy is going to be the next Gronkowski and like he's going to be the second coming of one of the greatest tight ends and I really just think it's going to be a mistake if we re if Joe pulls the trigger and tries to go for him I think like you said I think uh, offensive line and wide receiver. I'm fine with either or. And I think mm -hmm. that, you know, in terms of offensive line, you know, Joe, I want to get your thoughts. Can we really trust, you know, Tyrone Smith, Tyrone Smith mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and the rest of the guys, ABT or, you know, or Moses to stay healthy for a full 17 games. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's a huge stretch. And I just think when you have, when it comes to the depth of this offensive line, if one guy goes down, We've seen it. I'm, I don't, I see myself. If we, one guy goes down on this line and we're just looking at the rest of our depth, like, all right, who else is going to step up? Can, can we trust that? Can, you know, because we need to have protection. I, I just, you know, I, I, I'm for the weapon guys. I really am. But I just think offensive mm -hmm. line, getting that, getting that necessary depth, that reinforcement, let's say if we're in the playoffs, a guy goes down and then all of a sudden we're like, all right, maybe we can plug in Fuaga. Maybe we can plug in Fatanu. I, I mean, it is. What, what do you think, Joe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a hundred, I, I completely get the thinking in terms of like, we need that depth offensive lineman, but the off season doesn't end on April 25th, right? Like we could, we could get, we can get Bakhtiari, you can get Cam Fleming, you can get Smith. And when you really look at a lot of the prospects, whether it be, you know, whoever we're trading, if you're, if we're trade down, okay, it's a Mims, it's a Guyton, whoever it is. What are the chances that that player is going to be better than Bakhtiari? Pretty much zero, considering he's, if, if he's actually on the field, he's still a really good player, but let's cancel out Bakhtiari. What's the chances that they're going to be really much better than Donovan Smith or much better than a Cam Fleming where the difference between Marvin Harrison Jr. and neighbors to Lazard or even Boyd is, is astronomical. So I think that you could supplement your roster again, being shorter window type, you know, type thinking here, obviously we want the long-term guy, but for a one year window, just this year, just 2024, I think getting the, the, the weapon who is much better than anybody you can get right now is more beneficial and raises the ceiling of your team more than getting, you know, a, a depth offensive lineman who you could just sign in free agency, you know, anyway, now I get, not long-term building, you know, smart there, but it's, it might be a one or two year thing. So Darren writes in Knicks getting swept in the first round. Go Sixers. See you later, Darren. I mean, Black Bowers is definitely like the greatest player in the history. I'm going to be coming. I'm going to be coming. Where's Gary at, by the way? I figured the leader of the Bauer boys would want to call in and, and, and talk with Joe Blewett. Anyway, uh, Ray Danger's got a super chat for us, and the super chat says, I heard Joe Douglas loves Fuaga. What are the negatives in his game? Why does Joe have him at his fifth-rated offensive tackle? Your thoughts on mm -hmm. Fuaga and, and why you have him lower than seemingly a lot of other people? Yeah, I it's it's I'm, I'm so low on him. I think he's a good player, but just considering the the position, I think he'll 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 be at at the NFL level. I think he's a guard. Um, I don't think he moves very well for tackle. Uh, carries the outside head and very low in terms of like his redirect ability and balance. It's not really there. Um, there was even some clips that came out about the senior bowl. We're like, oh yeah, great play, pancake the guy. It's like yeah, but realistically, he would have been right in the quarterback's lap right there, and the quarterback's disturbed. So um, he lacks lateral movement for me, and I think he, I think like for teams who draft him, okay, try him at tackle. But I think at the end of the day, he will end up being a, a guard at the NFL level. So I like him at, as, as a guard. If the Jets had a situation where, hey, we need tackles and guards, then okay, uh, maybe I'm higher on Fuaga. But I want to tackle at this point, and I don't think Fuaga is going to be going to be a tackle. I think it maybe he, it's possible, but I think there's a pretty strong chance he's a guard at the NFL level. It's time for another V-Man call. Hopefully he no sleeping. Adios mio. <laughs> V-Man. V man, what the heck is going on in this room, V man? This is the most V man call ever. He's not here. The bed is made, and there's Spanish music playing. V man. Oh Goodbye. That's the end of that V man call. Now he can go back to sleeping. <laughs> Joe, I That's thought you were going to get your first V-Man call, but he wasn't there.
that I, I think that kind of like holds holds up to what he typically typically is, right? The, the, the sleeping and now not even showing up. Like he must just be so comfortable to call into the Jake Asman show and hey, I'll I'll leave the camera. It's okay. He's just not there. I mean, it, at least he wasn't <laughs> sleeping. Seemingly, my 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 dream is I go to him one day and he's just passed out on his bed. But that hasn't happened yet. It'll happen. I yep. faith in you, man. Uh, it probably will. All right, let's keep rolling with the calls right now. Let's go to Ricky and Y. What's up, Ricky? Hey, what's going on, Jake? And uh, I just want to say, Joe, really good breakdown. Uh, you know, I, I agree with a lot of what you said. And uh, mm -hmm. like I, I haven't been high on Bowers. Like w when I watched it, like for every like really good play that I saw mm -hmm. from him, I saw really bad tackling, like just all these like shoulder bumps, uh, you know, with nobody wrapping up. And that's not going to happen in the NFL. And yeah. Like, like me personally, and somebody on this show the other day when we were having this discussion typed in the chat, like, what other tight end, you know, have you seen that that uh, will take an end around? Well, Jaheim Bell, I watched him do it in person, uh, and he scored mm -hmm. too. And and we could get a guy like that later who's, who's you know, that Swiss Army knife, that, that analogy that everybody likes to throw around. And I said it a bunch of times, like, the high draft picks usually go to bad teams. Bowers is probably going to go early to a bad team, and he's going to be Cole Komet. And Jaheim Bell is going to go late to a uh, team like the Rams and have better numbers. And, and that's just my opinion. And uh, I don't know if you've really done any film on Bell or not, but I'd, I'd like to hear you know your opinion on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So for Bell, just transparently, I haven't. I like. I dive into the top, you know, the top 30 ish guys, just because again, I don't, I don't have so, so much time. So I want to get like more of the first round guys. So in terms of like bell being a better prospect than Bowers, um, I can't necessarily speak on that. And I won't, unless I've really, really watched the guy, I don't do that. Um, but in terms of like Bowers, yeah, I don't think it's a thing where like Ricky's wrong, where it's like, Hey, he's some absolute stud that nobody can replicate what he does. Again, I saw that more with Pitts. I saw, I saw a guy who was a freak, like Pitts is a freak in terms of his athletic upside. Now, Arthur Smith didn't use him right and all that stuff. But I see Bowers as a good athlete, but not some great athlete where you're going to be like people. The easiest thing that people say, Jake, is like, oh, well, he could just you know use that Debo Samuel role. It's like there's one Debo Samuel in the NFL. There's not another one. So just assuming that he's going to be Debo Samuel is quite with the risky Hackett thing to as do. his OC. Like that's the other thing. I love Rodgers, but like Rodgers doesn't love a ton of motion. And so much of what Debo does is like the creativity of like probably the best offensive coordinator in the league and Kyle Shanahan at head coach. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, I don't think they'll take advantage of him like that. Again, he figured out what week nine that Brees can catch passes or whatever he said, which is just b mind blowing. I think Parsons week two, he said like, oh yeah, we figured out he's he's kind of good. It's like, oh, I I I think we all knew that. So it's concerning that he's not going to use him in the right way. Now, with that being said, you know Aaron Rodgers is a guy who likes to go to the flat, you know, quite often flat and vertical. So if you're talking about like Bowers chipping and releasing and then getting into the flat, I think that's where he could benefit. You know, you saw some tight end screens last year. You saw some end arounds and and some jet sweeps that would obviously go to him and instead of Gibson. So I do think there's a role for him in this offense, but he's, he's not Debo Samuel. Like there's, again, there's one of those guys. So, uh, K and D writes in V man is celebrating 420. Happy 420 to all who partake. Maybe that's where V man was when we tried to go to him just before. I mean, uh, look, I, we'll try and go back to him. Maybe V man has a, has awoken or he's in the room. Who knows? It's time for another V man call. Hopefully he no sleeping. Adios mio. <laughs> hey, he's back. V man. Actually, I, I was going to make a cup of coffee. Uh, w w what's in the coffee? A little coquito? No, it's, it's not Christmas, man. That, that, that's a Christmas drink. Yeah, but you always drink V man. You're always dr high on life and drinking, you know? I mean, it's morning, and I got a headache because I dealt with someone who said something so brain dead, morally bankrupt. If I were to say it, you would all develop a migraine just from what they said. What did they say? Try it. They said the Cambodian genocide was a slight okay, error. Okay, okay, I, I should have asked. <laughs> go, go ahead, <laughs> yeah, like I said, not like I said that literally gave me a headache. But yeah, but honestly, I love your I love you pointing out the like. I love watching when you're looking down, breaking down the tape on Bowers and showing the little errors that, you know, that the Bowers boys are just, they can't see because they have their blinders on. You know, they, and they just, 
and it's it's all valid points and you know and the thing is with like i said tight end i've always and i've stated this many times is that it's not an absolute need for this jets team right now you can work with the tight end room that we have so mm-hmm. it's a want and there are more pressing matters like you know because when we look at really like our wide receiver room outside of Garrett Wilson is, you know, your bank, you're hoping, you're hoping, you know, the rest of them pan out. There, there's a chance they don't, but, you know, there's a chance. So maybe you're better off maybe trying to make a move to get a wide receiver or also your offensive line. A lot of these guys have injury risk. So maybe you're better off, you know, plugging that up, assuring that up. So there are areas that are more pressing need than tight end right now. We can manage with what we have, you know. If something were to happen to our offensive line, something happens to the wide receiver room, we might be in a bit of trouble going forward. So those two options, I think, are more pressing options than, you know, going tight end. Now, V-Man, did you get a haircut? The, the hairline looks good from what I could tell. Oh, uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, you, I, handsome, I getting, man. Getting, you know, getting a haircut before my trip. Oh, yeah. Wh- wh- when is the trip to Puerto Rico? You never told us. It's uh, going to be May 6th to... um. May 12th, you know, you know, I got, I got my itinerary set up, you know, bioluminescent bay, um, visiting the rainforest, touring old San Juan, might go visit, might go visit my cousins that I've never met before, you know, might go, um, um, let's see, like I, said, I visit the rainforest, um, try, oh yeah, zip lining. A tremendous. I, I, can you can you call us from the zip line, like when you're on the zip line? Um, I don't know if I'm gonna. I don't know if there's gonna be service out there. That's that, that's like the bush, man. There's, that's probably. All right. Well, here's what I need you to do. I need you to film some content of you in Puerto Rico, and we'll play whatever I, you send. All right. All right. I'll send you a clip of something. All right. I, I promise. I'll send you something. I want multiple clips for you, man. I mean, the people are dying to 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 really be a part of your first ever trip to your native land. Uh, this is going to be fun. Yeah, and I'm trying to figure out like what should be my first, like what, like what should I get first when I'm over there? V man, never change. That's the end of that V man call. Now he can go back to sleeping. <laughs> uh, I'm telling you, Joe. First time on the show, you're getting the full experience. I would like to see a V-Man recap of, of Puerto Rico. I was pretty close in St. John, so I don't know if it's somewhat similar, but I would like to see a recap of like some of uh, some of his his happenings there because it, it will get pretty interesting, seemingly. That's tremendous. A couple of super chats here. Yeah, we'll get right back to the calls. KAD says, agreed, V-Man. Good breakdown, Joe. That's right. Shout out to Joe Blowett. Breaking Thank down you. Bowers. Dealing with the Bower boys. Taking them head on. Uh, what are your thoughts on Steven Sack exchange coming at you, uh, Joe? Uh, can, can you handle the, the cult leader of the Bower boys on yeah. Twitter? Yeah, yeah, it's it's fine, man. Um, I don't have a I never had a problem with with any with sack or anything like that. It's just uh, I felt like there was some words put in my mouth, you know, in that situation saying I wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't he's a fourth round pick. I never said that just because I wouldn't take him at 10. I'm okay with taking him at 15, 16 in a trade down. It's not something where I hate the prospect. That's just inherently false. Uh, This one is from J Mags, who says Gary can't call in. He blew it during the film. Hold on. I got the perfect drop for this one. (laughs) Uh, yes. Anyway, uh, Rob Daniels, super chat. He writes in, he says, move up to get Malik or one of the big three, then go to free agency for one of the O-linemen to use up the O-line win. Now, I mean, that that's where I personally fall. Like if you're going to trade up, I'm comfortable doing it for any of the big three. The more I watch a though, because I, I was a big neighbors guy. I just don't think Marvin is realistic. So I've done like a lot of like, just watching neighbors. But the more yeah. I watch the Dunes and we had your coworker, your uh, Andrew Fialco on every mm-hmm. week. And we did uh, a, a Dunes a film study two weeks ago. I mean, I think he's the perfect fit for this offense with Garrett Wilson and Mike Williams. You don't have to rush him back. I, I think a Dunes a could play in the slot. He could play outside. Same with Garrett Wilson. Like I think like he would be the perfect fit, Joe. And then you're talking mm-hmm. about probably only having a move up to maybe like seven or eight to get them. So it wouldn't cost you as much as moving all the way up to like four or five or six. I, I don't know your thoughts, your thoughts on potentially trading up and like the fit for each of these guys with Aaron Rodgers. 
Yeah, I, I think Martin Harrison Jr. is 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 still clearly a one, um, really well rounded. All that stuff is just about kind of like you said, like your philosophy in terms of Marvin Harrison Jr. might take a first to trade up for, where neighbors might take a second and a fourth or a fifth, and Odunze might cost just a third. So it's like how much you know capital you really want to get rid of next year and this year, um, and then obviously your personal preference. I I still have neighbors and Harrison um, a decent amount above Odunze. I like Odunze. Uh, I do think he's a little bit raw. Uh, I don't know what tape he broke down, but he He's pretty good at like secondary releases and stuff like that with guys off of him, you know, 10, 15 yards off the line of scrimmage. He's pretty good with that because he's a bigger body and he moves a little bit faster than you expect him to. Uh, my m- major question with Odunze is, and I saw some scouting reports saying that like he's a really good, uh, you know, release guy off the line. I don't know if I saw him like cleanly beat press once in the entire 2023 season that I watched. So I do have some questions about him coming to the NFL and playing like true X receiver and being able to get off the line of, you know, against these number one and two corners. With that being said, can you play him at big slot? Can you play him Z? Or even if you do play him at X, could he be just a decoy because of how great he is at contested catches? Um, so those are some of the questions with Odunze. But in terms of him as a prospect, his upside is great. Like he's he moves really, really well for his size. His contested catch ability is the best I've seen in the last five, six years. Like just absolutely ridiculous. And then and then you consider that he can he's a yak guy too. You have you have Rodgers in situations where he might be in trouble in trouble. And you have Mike Williams and Odunze out there for contested catches. Like, watch out. So I really like Odunze. I would still prefer trading up for like a neighbor or even a Marvin Harrison Jr. or neighbors. But at the point where you're sitting at 10 and guys are starting to fall off the board and Chicago uh, is, is I think Atlanta's at eight, right? And Atlanta says, hey, fourth round pick, go come up and get Odunze, like do it. I know people are attached to draft picks, but that fourth round pick could be Brandon Dixon. It could be Shaq Evans. It could be, you know, Jeremiah George, whoever we want to talk about. So um, I am definitely in the camp right now of trading up for a receiver, 100%. I love it. All right, let's go to Adam. He's up next on the show. What's up, Adam? Hey, what's going on, Jake? Uh, thank you. What's up, Adam? Go first and foremost, and then mm-hmm. uh, Joe, like great, great film. Uh, learned a lot about, um, learned a lot about him today. Um, I will say I love uh, going for Marvin Harrison Jr. I think what we're looking for right now is like, we're not trying to be good in two to three years. Like it is mm-hmm. in right now and in the future. So we got to look at both. And I feel like um, Bowers, like, you're taking a big gamble and it's like, like we, you hear with everybody, there's so many different question marks. And if you get Marvin Harrison jr, you're looking at, I mean, like if you take the big step and you're capable of doing it, obviously you're getting Marvin Harrison jr, Garrett Wilson and Mike Williams. And you're talking about a jets team back in 2015 that almost went to the playoffs with Ryan mm-hmm. Fitzpatrick as our quarterback, just because we had two air, we had Eric Decker and Brandon Marshall. And the receiving core I just named could possibly surpass those two. So it's like, that's like an immediate drastic effect that we could have. Now, here's also, I want to get your guys' take on this, which has been very alarming for me, which is that Aaron Rodgers, typically in his career, the most he's ever thrown to a single tight end in a season is 92 targets in a, in a season, the very most. Tom Brady through to Benjamin Watson more consistently than that. And you might say uh, like, oh, well, um, uh, he had nobody else to throw to, yada, yada, yada. Drew Brees, also known for throwing to tight ends, he threw to Benjamin Watson 120 times in a season. So like, I feel like some of these quarterbacks or more looking for like pocket quarterbacks are looking to throw to tight ends a lot more. Whereas like Aaron Rodgers and these rollout guys are more looking down the field and I just don't want to get Bowers and then Aaron Rodgers not utilize him like he should be utilized. And and the last point I'll make is like a lot of people will say, well, he'll figure it out or like the offensive coordinator will figure it out. Well, Nathaniel Hackett has shown that he's not able to figure a lot of things out that are very obvious to the normal fan. But the one thing I know that he'll be able to do is if we have Marvin Harrison Jr. on the field, he will get him the ball. And I know that for a fact. Mm hmm. Yeah. Now, in terms of, I, I think the Jets were, correct me if I'm wrong, Jake, I don't know if you know the stat off the top of your head, but Nani put out all these 
thousands of articles of stats so they get jumbled yeah. up in my head but i i think i think um the jets were like th- like 12th or 13th in receiving uh yards from tight ends last year or something like that so with rogers uh, it's it's not a thing where like, i don't think hackett's going to make him a, a you know a debo samuel type deal but in terms of his fit for the offense i do think it's there because rogers does get to the flat really quickly they did run end arounds they did run sweeps they did run tight end screens like i said before so i think it's a thing where where he where he fits in the in the offense um you know overall i just don't think he's going to be like like highlighted like he was obviously at Georgia and I think at Georgia he was like 48 percent of the the his catches were behind the line of scrimmage and I'm not even sure you know then you then you then, then you take that okay 48 percent how much of those catches were now you know a yard or two or three you know uh in front of the line of scrimmage so a lot of his a lot of his production was schemed um and like I showed in the review there are certain plays where yeah he will truck a guy but then there are, are certainly plays where guys are playing two-hand touch with him and just letting him run past him so um it's it's a risky pick again there's a lot of gray area I didn't see him really in contested catch situations I don't like a deep ball tracking I didn't you know I have questions about him versus press I did highlight a lot of positives you know of him as well so plenty of question marks and then quickly on the receiver thing again it's about the ceiling I, I think those receivers raise your ceiling more more than an offensive lineman does and you're going for it all let's raise the ceiling you know you don't you don't win the Super Bowl by being conservative you know necessarily unless you have like a Patrick Mahomes and an elite head coach and Andy Reid yep well said good call there by Adam let's go to Bobby Midnight buckle up Joe Bobby's gonna bring it hello Bobby hey how you doing Joe <laughs> what's going on Bobby hey guess what Jake guess who I called this morning who'd you call Bobby oh, come on who do you think I called today Saturday uh well I mean I Beningo's on the fan Dan Gross oh, no, is on ninety eight seven you're for, oh okay I'm sorry I got you confused I called Dan from ESPN you called Dan Grasso did you ask Dan about Grasso. Kenobo Bobby yeah I talked X about he never heard of the guy but you got <laughs> listen to that and then play like you played on the air tomorrow and guess who else I called this morning oh God who'd you call take a guess today's Saturday. Oh, you did you call Mr. Bonesy at the shoe store? Yeah, guess who I got to talk to? You spoke to I Mr. Bonesy? To, yeah, and Joe. So his you, brother. You, you spoke to Joe Bonesy? Yeah, Joe called answered the phone, and I thought that was he sounded like same as same as that Mr. Bonesy. Wow. Well, yeah. you know what? Let, let's find out if this is all true. Mr. Bonesy, is this true? This is true, man. Uh, <laughs> called up and talked to my brother. <laughs> yes. I, just to, I just want to say the best part of today's show is Joe's face. <laughs> just watching all this stuff, all his expression when V Man was on the phone. I was looking at Joe, <laughs> dying. Yeah, I got a, a question for Joe though. How long have you been doing this? You look so young. Uh, yeah, I look a little bit younger than I am. I'm 31, so I've been like really no, like diving no, into the film. I don't, th- I don't believe you're 31. You look <laughs> like you're only 21. I could give you, you look- my social, Bobby. You could figure it out. Uh, I, don't, okay, I don't know. Okay, but you don't look 31. I thought you just out of college or something. The hairline's <laughs> like noble? slightly receding well, right here. Is that- I, I got gray hair. See so my like gray hair. <laughs> yeah. That's why. If I, I get close up, I can show you some grays, Bobby. It's it's there. So I'm 31. I'm weathered. You are originally too. Uh, I'm I'm from uh, Monmouth County. I'm from Jersey. Oh, Jersey, yeah. Okay. But do you yep. know a guy named Mike Blewett? He does a he's like <laughs> one of you guys. I don't I don't I, I don't think so. My okay, question I this whole thing. I thought it was your dad. My, my whole question with this is, Jake, is with this whole people calling into other sh- other shows, are you starting like a, a, a call in prank war here or what's what's going on? You know, I, the only thing I said is if anyone shows up to the draft with a <laughs> noble sign, I will buy that person a Jets jersey of their choice. And then Bobby decided to call <laughs> to the fan. And then the other guy called the other too. Uh, yeah, and then Johnny Quest called into the yeah, fan Johnny on a different Quest. show, and then he followed up and called Keith McPherson. So Keith has now gotten two calls about this Kenobi um, guy, and, and his brain is completely whacked. And I what heard about both Gator? of the Keith ones. Did he do Gator did me, huh? Gator did me when I called up. Remember? Yeah, he gatored you, Bobby. How do you feel? I lo- no, I love Gator. That's why I love him. I don't care. <laughs> I'm a comical guy anyway. I don't care. <laughs> Bobby said, "Hey, Bones, you're awesome, Bones." He was like, "What college did he go to?" Bobby's like, "It's just college." <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I didn't crack up, man. I tell you, I, I'm always laughing. 
And I was surprised. At that. I like Bobby, the guy. I like Bobby, the guy. how did the call go to to uh, to Dan Grasso this morning? Was it funny if I go and pull it later and play it tomorrow? Yeah, it was pretty good. I, yeah, he did not know who the guy was, and then the guy who he talked to after. Oh, I never heard of the guy either. I don't know who he talks to in the. No, who's in the background? I don't know. I'll, I'll go and listen to it. All right, Bobby. I'm glad you called. Yeah, I called. I thought it was funny. <laughs> Appreciate it, Bobby. Great call. Bones, you, it, it, did it make your day when you picked up the phone and Bobby Midnight's calling you at Alden? I, I mean, I just uh, it just makes me smile and laugh every time Bobby calls me. And my brother got him, and Bobby didn't realize. So Bobby's like, Mr. Bonesy? And, Bob, and <laughs> my, brother's like, my brother's like, no, Bobby, it's his brother Joe. <laughs> and then Bobby was talking to my brother for like five minutes before he gave it to me. Now my brother's like, "Man, Bobby's putting pressure on me to call this call the show." I'm like, "Well, now you got it." Yeah, uh, I want I want to I want to call from Joe Bo Joe Bonesy this week. We got to make that happen. We do, we do. I'll I'll, I'll push for it. Especially with uh, Alan's been hyping him up, if you haven't noticed, every time Alan's like Joe Bones, he's better than Mister Bonesy. But <laughs> anyway, back to football. Uh, you know, Joe, it's great to see you on the channel, man. You know, you know me, I've been following you for, for at least three years now. We've been, I did, we did the, uh, X factor, uh, fantasy football where you kicked my ass and, you know, it's, uh, it's been, it's been awesome. So if you guys are not plugged into X factor yet, you, you got, what are you doing? You know what I mean? It's the best jets content in terms of X's and O's out there. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I appreciate that. Mr. Bonesy. I do for sure. Hell yeah. Uh, and um, I I was just, Joe, I listened to Joe Douglas' interview again yesterday. And the, my favorite thing he said was when um, he said that it doesn't matter who we draft, that they're going to have to fight for a, um, a spot, you know, a starting position. Like even when they brought up Bowers, he was like, you know, even Kronk and Ruck, that, that shit's not coming easy. And I just, I love the flexibility we have. And then all this worry about like, I'm at the point now, I can't wait till Thursday, but I'm at the point where whatever they do, you know Aaron Rodgers is on board. So it's not like, oh, we're going to draft Bowers and Rodgers is going to be pissed. Like, yo, we're not drafting Bowers over uh, any other player if Rodgers isn't on board because if this is Rodgers' gig. So they're going to make sure that he's happy. So even if we do draft Bowers at 10, that means that, Bow that, that Rodgers signed up for it. So I'm at the point, mm -hmm. it's like, let's just see what happens. And I can't wait because I know I know the quarterbacks are gonna start rolling. Cause like Douglas said yesterday that you know we've we've prepared for the worst scenarios that no you know only two quarterbacks went. So uh, I'm sure we got all the options and I can't wait. I can't wait, baby. Let's go, Bones. I love a great call. Uh Saturday at the shoe store. Bones, you better be off by six. We got a Nick basketball game to watch. I love it. Yeah, look, I, I mean, I'm sure Rodgers wouldn't wouldn't mind any any pick that's an offensive lineman or a weapon. I, there's no doubt about that. I, I just think, I, but I'm sure if, if you gave Aaron Rodgers truth serum and you showed him like the the options for weapons that are somewhat realistic, if we're gonna say trading up for Marvin's not realistic, Joe, like I could definitely see Rodgers watching a Doomsday's film and being like, yeah, I could make back shoulder throws. Uh, you know, a staple in our offense with a Doomsday. Like I, I think he'd be the perfect compliment for what they already have in Garrett Wilson. Yeah, he's 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 done it already, right? Throughout his career, like that's what he's made a lot of his money on was you know back shoulder throws, and then you put Mike Williams, who's one of the more elite contested catch guys in the NFL, pair him with a probably again the best guy I've seen in contested catches at the collegiate level in the last five to ten years. Um, obviously, that'll be you know uh, exploited a lot in the offense, the back shoulder balls with with routers because he likes to go vertical a lot. Um, now, in terms of like him competing for a job, I, I think, okay, Bowers, yeah, he competes for like 11 personnel reps, maybe with Conklin a little bit. Like there'll be some some points where you're going to have one of Conklin or Bowers on the field. So I'm sure he'll be competing competing with Conklin. Obviously, the tackles will compete for starting jobs or maybe if it's Fatanu, he competes with John Simpson, however that's going to go. Yep. Um, is Marvin Harrison, Neighbors, or Adunze going to compete with Lazard for receiver three? Absolutely not. Like th that's, and that's kind of why I want, you know, to go receiver because like all these positions, like the other depth spots the Jets need guard, you can fill in free agency, tackle, you can, running back, you know, you can, depth at safety, you can fill in free agency. They need a legitimate starting receiver. And there are three of them at the top of the draft that I'm willing to go up for. Got time for two more calls. You got two legends to wrap us up. First up is Snowball. What's up, Snowball? <laughs> Hey, Jake. Hey, uh, Joe. How are you? 
What's going on, say, man? Happy Saturday. Uh, I had a question. Uh, Joe, are you and Andrew Fialco going to team up and like do some analysis stuff? Um, we haven't we haven't discussed it. Uh, Andrew joined relatively recently, so I haven't had so much interaction just because we have I think I have like 30, 35 writers, so I don't interact with everybody, but it's 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 a possibility. I think the two of you would be a, like that would be really good. I think you guys would make a great pair. Um, Thanks. Other other thing, Jake, you created a monster. Uh, Bobby Midnight is a monster. He Bobby is. Bobby Midnight is relentless, man. He's calling every talk show in this city asking about Knoebel. It's unbelievable. He's, he's everywhere. He is everywhere. He's <laughs> everywhere. Incredible. Incredible. All right. Well, listen. Dogs say hello. I don't know if you can see the dogs. <laughs> yes. Dogs. What say are their hello. names? Uh, we're babysitting uh, Wellington. He's the. He's the. I don't know what kind of dog he is. But the the little one's mine. That's Bruce. Bruce, uh, named after Bruce Hall, Jets running back. Bruce Wayne, but yeah, Bruce Hall now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Have a good one. Bruce Take care, guys. Bruce Thank you, Snowball. That is like a wiener dog who looked. Uh, he's quite quite chunky there. He needs he needs the he needs to walk for quite a bit there to to burn that off. Joe, this show has officially now had everything. K and D has gifted five count of five memberships, baby. Here we go. Money, 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 money. The following listeners just became as maniacs: Ragnar, Alex Johnson, Brett Accardo, Joe I, Gang Green. Thank K and D because you are now. And as Maniac. All right, let's get to a legend. We could not wrap up a show that features a New York Knicks playoff game later today without hearing from our hype man, ladies and gentlemen, King Lowski. What's up, Lowski? Jake, my brother. Jake, my brother. Joe, my brother. What's good, my brother? It's always <laughs> good to hear a fellow Jet fan that's not a power boy. All right? Man, Joe, man, you're doing a great job, bro. I heard your analysis, my guy, man. If we could take a weapon first, I would definitely take a weapon. You know, I'm an old line guy myself, but I just wanted to come on here real quick and just uh give my motivation, baby. It's round one, and I heard a lot of noise out of Philly. Yeah, I heard y'all talking a lot of noise. Y'all wanted the Knicks. Well, here we are, baby. We here, okay? Let's go, baby. Let's go, Knicks. All right? We're going we gonna to take these fools in five. You can best believe that, baby. Let's go, Knicks. All right? Yankees won yesterday, baby. Let's go. All right? Soto hitting home runs like it ain't nobody business. All right? We're going to take this drive by storm, baby. You can best believe that. Huh? J-E-T-S. Yes, yes, yes. Let's go, baby. Let's go, Jake. Let's go, King Lowski. I love it. I love it. Joe, you got it all. Your first ever appearance on the show. You got V-Man. You got Lowski. You got Bobby Midnight. You got Bonesy at the shoe mm -hmm. store. K&D gifting memberships. I mean, you got, you, got, you got it all on your first show. Yeah, it's quite quite interesting. Definitely, definitely the change up. I'm hoping this is not my uh, my last time, but I'll be vicariously living through you guys today because the the Nets and the Devils are uh, are set at home. So I'll be rooting for the Knicks somewhat. I I do like Brunson. I like their grit. I like the uh, and I'm definitely rooting for the Islanders over the over the Rangers. I know I think you're an Islanders guy, so I'll, I'll be rooting for the Islanders. I have no no bias against the Islanders at all. So good luck 100%. there. Yeah, I'm just gonna get yeah. uh, if the Islanders or Rangers win their first round series, they'll meet in the second round, which would be wild. So yeah, I right. went to the Devils. I went. I actually paid to me and my grandma grandpa when I, I i paid like five six hundred dollars for like almost glass seats and then they got i think it's three nothing the first game so not not the best last year but that's my <laughs> thanks to everybody tuned in i want to acknowledge the super chat from knd he says i just got my gus buster delivered much love bro appreciate you we appreciate you king of dreams you've gifted so many memberships so it was the least we could do to send you a gus buster umbrella it looks like it was raining out today or maybe it's supposed to rain later i don't know so maybe that'll come in handy for you today if you're in the uh, New York area, KND. Anyway, Joe, great job, man. Really big fan of yours. So glad we finally could get you on the show. We will definitely do it again. You know, when the Jets mm -hmm. make their picks, we'll get you on. We want to get your analysis on maybe the film on whoever they mm -hmm. end up taking, some of the other guys, too. You, I mean, everyone follow Joe. You see his Twitter up there next to his name. Check out his work, JetsXFactor.com. Him, Robbie, Nania, Fialco, Ripka. The list goes on and on. They do a tremendous, tremendous job. 
covering the Jets. Anything you want to plug on the way out here, Joe? Yeah, just Joe RB31 on Twitter, Blue It Splits on uh, on the YouTube, get into the nitty gritty with the film so you really know what you're what you're getting when you draft these guys. And if you want me to come back, break down draft picks one through seven, I'm I'm more than willing to uh, to do it. Uh, again, definitely nice nice change up for my show. Ricky with a super chat at the buzzer as we're trying to wrap. Why don't people get we could get Rome and O line depth? I'm with you, Ricky. I mean, if they take Rome, I would expect as Joe brought up, Bakhtiari, Donovan Smith. <laughs> Uh, re-signing McGovern. There's ways they could solidify their offensive line depth and still get a weapon. Once again, thanks to Joe for joining the show. Thanks to all the Asmaniacs out there. Hit the like button on your way out. Comment down below your thoughts if you're not watching live on Brock Bowers after watching some more film with him. Ladies and gentlemen, he's Joe Blowett. My name is Jake Asman. We'll talk to you guys soon. J-E-T-S. Jets, Jets, Jets. McMonagle here with you. We'll take your phone calls on the draft, on anything else. And you know what? Let's go right to John and Seaford for it real quick. John and Seaford, what's up, bud? Hey, T-Mac. How you doing, buddy? Good, man. How are you? I'm good. You know, working these hours, I appreciate you being on the radio and uh, keeping me company. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you out there making phone calls, keeping me company. You got it, bro. Hey, Nixon 6, that's my first thing. There you go, Nixon 6. I like it. It even rhymes. Uh, I just want to talk about the Jets draft, if I can. Mm -hmm. A lot of these Jets fans out there want uh, Brock Bowers. Yes. My that friend is, that Barry is the... loves it. That is the sexy name surrounding the Jets, no doubt about it. I think it's a te you know, terrible pick. Um, my friend Gary's like a big Bowers boy. Oh, well, Bowers, well, well, what makes bad. you think it's a terrible pick? I just feel like the guy take it all on. Um, I think the three options you go, for me personally, O-line, right? Receiver, if a doomsday's there, you take him. Or if Knobel out of college is there, you got to take Knobel. Um, 5'7", 198. Plays both sides of the ball. Um, not sure if you know him. No Kuiper had him top 15 pick. What do you, what do you thoughts on Canova? Um, I don't know him that well. I'll be totally honest with you. But um, I, I don't know why bro, I got to uh, do more uh, draft prep. I'll be honest with you. I, I haven't been focused on him because I don't think uh, – I think the Jets are probably going offensive weapon or offensive line. So, I don't, you said he plays both sides of the ball. Makes me think you're – who plays both sides of the ball in the NFL? But, yeah, I mean, listen, I don't know why you're, you're down on the Brock Bowers pick. I mean, that would be everything you hear and everything you – I mean, he is going to be a legitimate pass catching. I, I mean, he is going to be a stud player. On the 2022 draft pick, <laughs> the pick goes to Knobel out of college. <laughs> <laughs>